a nice crowd in here. Uh, I was joking of Danny earlier that we do have this tradition of scheduling uh, an event on the, at the museum when there's a Super Bowl. And, uh, uh, and I always say, you can do both. You can you know, hang out with poetry and then do the Super Bowl. I prefer just to hang out with the poets. Uh, so uh, just a little thank you to Danny. Danny is our poet in residence. And he's mainly known uh, to me as a person who organizes events like this and does a great job just connecting people, having them show up and give unique perspectives. And this is within that uh, tradition at this point, right? And so let's just give a warm welcome to Danny Schott. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank Bob Foster, Holly Metz, Rand Hoppy, Lois Delivio, and Bill back there, who is standing by the wine. Um, <laughs> you know, he doesn't drink. He's just standing by the wine. Um, this is a free event, but we do ask if you can spare it. Um, admission is usually $5, but even Better than that, what I did is there's a raffle, um, three tickets for $5. So you actually, instead of being a donation, it'll be like an investment, maybe. <laughs> so if you want to buy um, raffle tickets, see Bill back there, buy the wine, have a glass of wine, buy some tickets. And like I said, maybe it will be an investment. Look who just walked in. <laughs> Yay, yay. Is that <laughs> okay? So, <laughs> so I'm juggling orders here and stuff, and Reggie's here. So we're gonna go back to the original order. I'm sorry to everybody who I shifted around. Um, damn. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you're here, Reg. You still are, man. <laughs> Go take a leak, have a drink, <laughs> but be up here in five minutes. Okay. Richard Bruce Nugent, born in Washington, D.C. in 1906, was a Harlem Renaissance writer, illustrator, and actor, a friend of writer Zora Neale Hurston, and a co-founder with poet Langston Hughes of the influential and to the more staid community members, shocking, 1926 black literary magazine, Fire, which included pioneering explorations of homosexuality, bisexuality, color prejudice, and interracial relationships. Nugent's contribution to the issue, the short story, Smoke, Lilies, and Jade, features a protagonist who, like its author, proudly de declared his gay identity in a foreword for a 2002 collection of Nugent's work, Gay Rebel of the Harlem Renaissance, which is this book. And as I talk, um, this was um, put together um, by Thomas Worth. It's part biography, um, as well as a collection of Nugent's art and writing. I sort of feel like I'm doing a book report um, on it because I got, so much inf I got so much information about Bruce Nugent from it. Anyway, Henry Louis Gates in the intro describes Nugent as, quote, one of the key figures in both the creative world of the Harlem Renaissance and the complex underground world of gay culture. In his later years, this proud gay artist was sought out and praised, his accomplishments recognized. Scholars and filmmakers came to see him in the city where he spent his last eight years, Hoboken, New Jersey. And that's the basics of Nugent's bio. And it was put together, um, the words I just said, by Holly Metz, and I thank her for that. As a matter of fact, the idea for this event came from a chance encounter um, with Holly in early December on the corner of 4th and Garden in front of Demarest School. She said to me, and she was all excited, do you know the artist Bruce Nugent? He lived in Hoboken. I admitted my ignorance. 
And then I started doing my research that very day. Richard Bruce Nugent, or Richard Bruce, or Bruce Nugent, his friends called him Bruce. Um, and that was actually his mother's maiden name, um, having come from a prominent Washington, D.C. family. He had an amazing life. Um, during the apex of the Harlem Renaissance, Nugent was as well known, and this is the 1920s, as his best friends, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, Aaron Douglas, and Wallace Thurman. And they were the younger, brasher generation of the movement, the movement being the Harlem Renaissance. Nugent went on to live his life, always an artist. As a matter of fact, when you came in, you saw his, um, some of his artwork. Um, he traveled extensively through the world. He was a dancer, and he was often inv involved in efforts to develop black dance companies in the 1920s and 30s. He was an actor uh, appearing um, in the production of Porgy, which ran for years in New York and around the world, and that's before it was Porgy and Bess. Um, he was an unparalleled raconteur, storyteller, man about town. He also lived a longer life than many of his contemporaries of the Harlem Renaissance, which brings us to Hoboken. Always an artist, he had been living in his studio in Lower Manhattan, um, down, I don't know, the financial district. And the building where he had his studio would often be locked on weekends, um, effectively rendering him homeless for the weekend. And he often stayed with a friend in Hoboken and eventually found an apartment on 14th and Bloomfield Street. Um, that's the place where my doctor is, or, or was. I'm not even sure. Um, I'm sure it's where he lived. I'm not sure it's where my doctor is anymore because she seems to have disappeared. Um, and that's a problem. <laughs> but anyway, he was in that place on 14th and Bloomfield. And he held court often at the Madison Cafe, which I think Tom Vizzetti owned at the time, or maybe um, he had just sold it. A really good film was made in 2004 called Brother to Brother, and I saw it on Amazon. I had to pay $2.99 for it, but it was really good, and I highly recommend it. It gives us a look at the older Bruce Nugent, though the filmmaker, Rodney Edge. Rodney Evans commits what I consider an unforgivable sin. Um, he took the action out of New Jersey and put it in New York City, even though at the time Bruce Nugent would have been in Hoboken. So here we are in Hoboken, a few blocks away, celebrating the life and legacy of Richard Bruce Nugent. We have four really talented writers who will be reading and performing their own work and the way I see it, that's the best way to honor an artist, with original creations to carry on their legacy. Um, with that said, I'd like to start things off with a poem by Bruce Nugent, and this is titled, My Love. My love has hair like midnight, but midnight fades to dawn. My love has eyes like starlight but starlight fades in morn. My love has a voice like dewfall, but dewfall dies at a breath. My love has love like life's all, but life's all fades in death. Bruce Nugent. So let's get the party started. Reggie Gaines is a published poet Tony Award winning playwright, Grammy Award nominated lyricist, and I artistic director of the Downtown Urban Arts Festival since 2007, and Reggie Gaines is here now. Let's have a warm round of applause for Reggie Gaines. Hi, I'm Amma. <laughs> Nice to meet you. Hey, Reg. You ain't broke? No, <laughs> What's the best light? <laughs> of course. I didn't shoo you away. 
The nerve of him. Where you get that t-shirt said? Wait, uh -huh. yeah. Where you get that t-shirt? He gave it to you? Yes, sir. Damn, I'll be out doing the last poet gave Sid that t shirt, so you know she must be hot. <laughs> right, well, most of you, right? Yeah, yeah. So get it out the way. I think that's mine. Ba -ba -da -ba 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 -ba. Sid, my family was so happy after the card game the other night. <laughs> Danny's wife is the best person on the face of the earth. No doubt about it. I know Danny does. I was dreaming. A poignant, excruciating, beautiful dream. I was in a flower garden, canopied by spreading oaks, perfumed by fresh magnolia blossoms. I was in Eden. Then became aware of a presence, an ivory body exuding some exotic perfume. This presence called to me, lured me closer, closer, closer. Involuntarily, my eyes closed and I was conscious of being sucked in until there was a complete merging for one complete moment. I experienced supreme ecstasy then the garden disappeared. Richard Bruce Nugent. Nineteen, when he left Washington, D.C. to go to New York City, traveling with Langston Hughes. Nineteen, Langston Hughes, traveling to the city. Harlem Renaissance is in full bloom. It's actually in... It's about to become the most important literary movement in the history of Black America. It's really, I mean, think about that. Nobody knew. And what is this 19-year-old do, 19-year-old doing traveling with Langston Hughes, all right, in 1925 from Washington? I can't find any information. Were they together? Were they family? I just can't, nothing can be corroborated. But what was he doing with this guy? You know, that's like Paul Beatty traveling with Sid, you know, in a way. So I want to kind of wonder why we all know Langston, but none of us knew Bruce, all right? Or very few of us knew Bruce, all right? Um, they were both gay, all right? Langston's poetry obviously was geared toward the Black experience. Bruce's poetry was more, it leaned more on lyricism, imagery, ambiguity, all right? But is that why? Langston never wrote, well, not never, but Langston very rarely wrote about his sexual preference, right? Bruce, whether you knew it or not, you could read his poetry. Yeah. Lord me closer. Involuntarily, my eyes closed, and I was conscious of being sucked in. That's lyricism, that's imagery, that's, you know, abstraction. Is this the reason why we knew one and not the other? That's the question I want to have answered today. I hope my three cohorts can enlighten me. All right, so let's look at two of their poems. Black Child at a carnival by Langston Hughes. Where's the Jim Crow section on this merry-go-round, mister? Cause I want to ride. Down south where I'm from, white and colored can't sit side by side. In the south on the train, there's a Jim Crow car. On the bus, we're put in the back. But there ain't no back to a merry-go-round. Where's a horse for a kid that's black? Shadow by Robert Bruce Nick. Robert, Richard. We, him and I, had he, he scolded me because I sent him something I was going to supposedly read and it had Robert on it. And when I put R, I have 
a bunch of friends name when i put r robert you know how your computer if you put a letter or two letters something will pop up and robert just popped up so i never looked at it so i apologize he but still goes by that <laughs> it's true it's true here that's how i printed <laughs> Silu a shadow by richard bruce nugent silhouette on the face of the moon am i dark shadows in light lacking color vivid brightness defined clearer because i am dark black on the face of the moon shadow am i growing in light not understood as is the day but more easily seen i am a shadow in the light so does sexual preference this is a good term right does sexual preference preordain or kind of make you write about that does your sexual preference force you to write in that way are you writing about that using it as a theme is it a so topic is it subject does being black make you write about being black does it make you talk about black experiences it's a hard question to ask or answer it's a hard question to ask but it's a hard question to answer and i don't have the answers but kind of knowing some of their poetry i know a lot of Lexi, but knowing their poetry they were leaning in certain directions for whatever reason i mean as a writer as all of us as writers where do we lean? let me ask you where do you lean as a writer is it sexual preference or is it skin color I want to ask the three of you, so just, you know. Um, Can you hear her? I'm, I'm, I'm into the, the sound of the words. That's enough. Sid. So, yes, I guess whatever inspires me. Say that again. Whatever inspires me, whatever subject, whatever topic inspires me. Say yours again. I'm into the sound of the words. So, yes, whatever inspires me. I want to make music with the words. That's what I want to do. So whenever I get up to, I may be, I might be moved by what is yours against it. I may be moved by social justice. What is yours again? Whatever inspires me. Okay, but I have to figure out a way to put the notes, use the words to make it sing. If I'm not making it sing, the subject matter or the theme is totally useless to me. So when I get to the end of it, if it's not singing, delete, delete, or rip it up. You know, like just rip it up. So I'm with you totally. And I'm now now I can't wait to hear your poems. <laughs> okay, this is for um, I think I wrote this as Cliff Notes for Dummies to the Harlem Renaissance. I think. Dark Tower After Hours Rock. Madam CJ's daughter decked two limestones with dough from Ma's hot combs, and there was poetry and song, and Satchmo caught the beat and kicked it down to Duke. The elegant Ellington playing what he want, but Garvey did too. Black star line, cause he knew what time it was. Walker, Alilia, silver turban, six foot frame, vivacious curves and nerves like a pit bull's balls. Gang's all here, and I swear, Langston, was always broke. Nigga was clean, but broke. Du Bois was a voice choice, a lock, like Alain, like Nugent, like stylish, like Zorda, sassy as a god watching his eyes on her prize. White lies plus Jesse Forsett, best bet to get poems seen. And on the black screen was in our gates by Oscar, me show. No go down Moses but a maze, dazing them phased us. Can't drink, can't cuss, can't fornicate, and couldn't wait to assimilate on 136 near 8th. Spot got length since witty blues clung to the wall. New gents sucking hot sticks right down the hall. County cullen counting couplets. White folks chewing chitlins, black folks sipping champagne. Bubbles of double your troubles like tumors cane. Not sugar, but sweet like corinto when the sun go down. And Harlem be brown like Pattis, be bright like Josephine Baker, banana nut shaker making jazz the mother tongue. And how much sun can one man make? Lil you be Blake keying songs with noble sizzle shuffling long. And you was wrong if it wasn't about the race. 
because most of the rest got a nasty taste of a different kind of beat. Harlem, sweet, sweet Harlem. Blowing slow, playing fast. Enjoy yourselves, because it ain't going to last. I'm almost done, damn. This for you. Because when I said to you the other night, did you notice? She said, I don't know that. I don't know that. Here. This is the first pass of uh, Triumph by the Wu-Tang Wu -Tang Clan. I don't know how you of all people didn't know this. Here. I bomb atomically. Socrates, Socrates, philosophies, and hypotheses. Can't define how I be dropping these mockeries. Lyrically, right? Google it when you go home. All right, you need to learn that by heart. Any questions? I'm leaving. Thank you, Reggie. That was fantastic. Our next poet apparently lost some money the other night. Um, but um, I heard her talking to someone um, before as we were sitting here. And she's like, I don't call myself a poet or a writer. And I was like, but I call you a poet. Um, anyway, Sid. Cherise Fulton is editorial assistant for Black Renaissance Noir Journal and founder of Emphatic Press. She's a 2012 Pushcart Prize nominee. Her work is featured in several publications, literary journals, and she has two chapbooks, Feeding Off the North Star and Emphatic Radical. In 2018, her poetry manuscript, Equitable Rage, was read at Fierce, co-sponsored by the National Park Service, and convened at the National Women's Rights Historical Park in Seneca Falls, New York. Let's hear it for Sid Charisse Fulton. Yes, he did. I ain't got one. <laughs> I'm more, I'm already nervous, so you know. Oh, stop. Wasn't nervous about taking your part. I know, that's right. <laughs> so I'm just, I got three poems, one of which is actually Bruce Nugent's poem, but I'm, I'm just going to go for this right now. Bruce who? Never heard of him. And I know a little something about the Harlem Renaissance earned an NYU degree under the humanities, and never once during studies did the name Bruce Nugent come up among those of Hughes, Hurston, Baldwin, Bontemps, Cullen, McKay, Johnson, etc., etc. Oh yeah, and what does Hoboken have to do with the Harlem Renaissance? <laughs> Usually, I write what is on my mind and stimulates my mood. So I did some research on Mr. Unknown, and in an attempt to be motivated, I found some stuff. However, I slumped in my chair, slid my glasses to the tip of my nose, sucked my teeth and said aloud, what is this shit? I perused Nugent's poems and prose, they sparked the same negative attitude in me as did the readings of Shakespeare for the first time. Come on, man, where's the power in the punch in this stuff? Harlem Butterfly, Smoke Lilies and Jade, My Love, Shadow, and more. However, I decided to read the poem Shadow again from my perspective. When I finished, I slumped in my chair slid glasses down to the tip of my nose and said aloud, this is the shit. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so I'm, I'm going to read Shadow, even though it's been read. But um, I, I, I did it thinking the way that I would hear it and read it. Okay. On the face of the moon, am I a dark shadow in the light? A silhouette? Am I on the face of the moon lacking color or vivid brightness, by, but define all the clearer because I am dark? Black on the face of the moon, a shadow. Am I growing in the light, not understood as is the day, but more easily seen because I am shadow in the light. Crunch, whatever that crunch is down there, but it's there. Then what I did was I read it from bottom to top because Sister Sonia Sanchez told me that's a way to see if that poem has really got some. So I want to test Mr. Nugent's, you know. Okay, I am shadow in the light because, but more easily seen, not understood as is the day, growing in the light, a shadow am I. Black on the face of the moon, I am dark because, but defined all the clearer or vivid brightness, lacking color on the face of the moon, a silhouette, am I? A dark shadow in the light, am I? On the face of the moon, silhouette. <laughs> so he was a bad brother. Okay. So then what I did was I created this poem, trying to carry the feel of what I got from reading uh, Mr. Nugent's work. This one is titled, Call Me Bruce. In the words of Richard Bruce Nugent, you'd be surprised how good homosexuality is. I love it. Mid-1920s, West 136th Street, between 5th and 6th Avenues, I arrive unchained at Niggerati Manor, where a pulpit is paper, the fire publication. I'm novice to the game. Scholarly blowtorches such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Honor Bontemps make no attempt to spotlight true insight of Claude McKay or James Weldon Johnson. But rest assured, I surrender only to me, writing and painting whenever I feel like it. Feeling it when Harlem massages my mentality, soothing my DC decadence in nigger literary heaven. Hell, the great migration spreads wings on Lenox Avenue day and night spotlighting Negro Renaissance opportunity for social and economic uplift. I don't hide who I am in tenements, brownstones or speakeasies. Sugar Hill is artistic sanctuary for my tea. My boon companions, Wallace Thurman and Langston Hughes, biscuit, bo bohemian gravy, salvaging my poem, shadow from garbage can discard. Langston, Wally and I, Shout outside County Cullen's window, our floor shine shoes on his stoop, ready to step, stomps. Come on, Count, the capital of Black America is waiting on us. Headed to Hamilton Lodge, where male shimmy shimmers like fringe on Cotton Club culottes. Or maybe we'll tailgate Hansberry's clan house, where Gladys Bentley sings wearing tuxedos. Sexual expression is cosmopolitan artistic flowering. It rolls over me like jazz octaves when I bathe. Not my concern though, some may worry about who I roll with and how. My uniqueness, my shadow oneness, so-called openness, is a filbert brush used to paint freedom. I be peaceful ocean for other creatives continuously shackled on marginalized vessels, considered chattel, bearing scars from homo homophobic whips. Harlem hoisted me from slave ship to apprenticeship where poetry and bigotry speak to each other. 
So call me what you want. I may or may not answer. Rest assured, I surrender to only me, writing and painting whenever I feel like it. I'm going, I'm going. She's a poet, right? <laughs> now, I'm just a little curious. Um, before you saw the posters for this event or anything, who in, who in this room um, had heard of Bruce Nugent before? Raise your hands. Okay, I see three, four hands. One person I know for sure had heard of Bruce Nugent um, is Robert Gibbons, um, which is why he was like the first person I asked to be part of it. In his own words, let me tell you what Robert said. Bruce Nugent is one of my literary ancestors. I have followed his work from Washington, D.C. to the Harlem Renaissance. He knew Langston Hughes and Alan Locke. Now he lives again in Hoboken. And that's true. There is all these people here talking about Bruce Nugent. But let's talk about Robert Gibbons, an amazing poet. <laughs> How is everybody doing? I think to answer Reggie Gaines's question about how did uh, Bruce Nugent find Langston, Langston spent time in Washington, DC. He was secretary to one of the famous studies of African-American studies in, in Washington, DC. And if you read the book, Hide and Seek, you will find that they knew each other. They walked in the same circles. They attended the same salons. So we find our own. I'm going to read a few poems to the Harlem Renaissance. I am an, I am an inheritor of the, the Harlem Renaissance. Langston Hughes, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, James Baldwin. And then there's me. <laughs> I entitled some of these poems Beyond the Visible. The black teacher must instill his students with a spirit of curiosity and encourage an attitude of aggressive social and political responsibility towards the total society. The Negro teacher will endure as long as America endures. And he will endure because he has something to say. He is the designated carrier of a rich folk wisdom. Ralph Ellison. Jacob Lawrence is Harlem, 1942. The color is brownstone. The known and unknown walk the streets. It's all peat and concrete, and there are carriage rides with Garveyite. The tight fit of Harlem, a shot calls them. The ropes and pulleys pull me back to the Renaissance. I smell bread from the shop, the Lindy Hop, beneath the floorboards of the church. It's still hurt and worth. In one dark body, Jacob Lawrence, you now hang in the MoMA. I'm having a conversation with your painting. There is a ladder, the clatter of the old subway line, the water baptism of Emmett Till until kingdom come, Jacob. The red truck, fire, red truck of the hydrant. I'm tired of nostalgia, the street scenes of Tyree Nichols and Michael Brown. I'm uptown, Jacob, I'm uptown. Maybe. I'm just giving a moment. Give myself a moment. Bruce goes to the opera. The moment became an open heart surgery. 
The streets are ventricular. It was the Met, so it was titular. As I raced for a 7.30 curtain, I called her Violetta, the woman in the red dress. Her presence was center stage as the diamonds sweep me into the proscenium, the gilded chandelier like snowflakes, the fake and feign. It was all theater. All meters on the playbill, the oversized clock remind me as it winds. Bruce, I'd rather leave this behind. I'd rather aim for the goal for the sold out crowd than the name. I'd rather the hold on to cognition. My piece is all that's left all the interpretation of interpretation, all the trepidation of being exclusive. This was another version of the same. It was all perturbation of the vein, sitting a few steps before the stage, acting as if I had made it with those $200 tickets with flicks of rubies and mink stoles from the forest. How many carrots are on that one row? I'm appalled by this sight, this sleight of hand, wincing as I came with the slit wrist and a dead woman that ends the show. Bravo, Bruce. Bravo. I came from the Harlem Renaissance. The man lives among the Virginia sandstone. He archives his wares, accessioning his paper bags, his worth it's cast iron steel, a hand-me-down from the plantation. He runs through the street like a fugitive slave. He hides in the undercroft of the church like Frederick Douglass, the backdrop of the National Portrait Gallery, aligns his thick stick figure. He drools from the paintbrush of William Johnson, the color of cow dung and chitterlings, his nose a lampshade with light. I went to see Gilbert and Catlin, but the man with the shopping cart became a part of the permanent collection. I'll do a few more. Dear Langston, I had this situation going on in class and I had to go all Harlem Renaissance on their ass. I'm glad you told Richard Bruce Nugent that Ralph Ellison wants to meet him. This grounds my piece solid, Robert Gibbons. Dear Robert, I'm glad you went Harlem Renaissance on their ass tell that person that problem with the white man's fishing hole to read my essay, The Artist in the Racial Mountain, Langston Hughes. Yes, I had to list the white man's fishing hole among the distasteful things, among the Jordan Davises and Sean Bells and Trayvon Martins and Tyree Nichols. As long as I come from the tradition, there are no fairy tales. No Batmans and Supermans, no black superheroes on the Cartoon Network, no traditions of equality from the beginning. So when this is not universal, it's universal for me. Still do I look my identity after Gwendolyn Brooks. I came a long ways to get to Harlem. It was 14 years ago, my migration below Mason Dixon with all the contrition of Dixie, and this is not relevant anymore, the deplorable wasteland we have made of it. Something must be kept sacred, like keeping the obituaries or the reliquaries of the ancestors. And the reason for a description is that I have a round brown face a trace of pigeon peas and cornbread on my tongue, and it is a song that saved my life in the midnight hour. I'll do a few more. Soul food. I saw the sign Negro for sale. I saw the large boulevard full of shopping bags and cell phones, the double name of Lennox and Malcolm, the double vein hangs from the facade. The Harlem I know is a crowded church. Cosmetic scaffolds gentrify the pathetic. Marcus Garvey was just historic. Samuel J. Battle did not know it, was hungry, but hair still rules the braids and the bangles looked around the corner for Wrangle was hungry, but people stand and bump the corner, groups of women speaking Spanish. Empty lots like toothaches for another high on Jesus Christ on 127th, but I was hungry. And I had to deal with the quiet whisper and the double speak. All my inspiration is gone. It's gone to Harlem. (sighs) 
I'm going to read one from the book. I do have a copy of my book if you're interested. Thank you so much. Thank to Danny Schott. Thanks to Sid and Reggie and Alma for being with us. Close to the tree. See my beautiful picture on the page, on the front? I still have one copy. Hostage for 18 minutes. She said I could not go on the train for another 18 minutes. My old school ways would never disrespect my elders, would never call anyone out by their name, but she behind glass speaking to me through microphone, speaking in drones, her late night gig monotone, her nightcap of a watchman, or should I say a watch person. I had a chance, she had a chance to use her power a wallflower waiting to tangle or wrangle with someone. I politely stood on street level as people made Harlem the collage, as pieces of the street were torn in rips and people on stroll and sail, as people telling the night to stay on for a few more hours. But I could not hang with the late night musicians, the ones that play the standards over at Red Rooster or Paris Blue, the ones that move in circles and burp off cheap hooch in plastic cups, the night was hot and women on display, the shorter the better. The weather had them stripping themselves like paint and I could see clear up her street with the Daisy Dukes. It was so salacious as I stood there for 18 more minutes. I had to finish this song that haunts me. I had to diminish the feeling that confronts me. I had heard all the musicians talking in the back of the room, how they had gigs at the shrine, how they had gigs downtown. Only I was a verbal musician. I had I had not signed a contract. I had only my body as instrument, my throat in Parker's saxophone, and my lungs were in the mood of Monk. But in those 18 minutes, the street became classic. As I stood on Lennox, rinsing the sweat from the back of my skull, I had held my weight in this push and pull for the late night of nowhere, the thoroughfare of musicians, be it musical or phonetician, had held me there for 18 more minutes. Thank you. That, that was totally wonderful, Robert. You know, there's people watching this right now, live stream on Facebook and YouTube. And what I'd like to ask you to do is have a round of applause for Robert again so that people who are watching this live stream know there's an actual good audience here. So let's make people hear. Okay, with that said, one quick public service announcement. Um, this is a free event, but there's a raffle going on. You can get three tickets for $5. And I'm saying that out of pure selfishness because I would be a little bit embarrassed if I wind up winning um, because not enough people bought raffle tickets and I have to stand up here as the winner. So please, three tickets for $5. Or if you just don't want to do that, um, you could slip some money into that little box there. Yes. That's a, the museum gets it so that we, Bill, he's right back there. Go see Bill. Oh, he'll even come to you. <laughs> see Bill, he'll give you those tickets. Okay, <laughs> $5 bill. Amma Birch is the author of Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, Faces in the Clouds, Sonic Boom, Ferguson Interview Project, and a video game, yep, Available for Android, Spacequake by Amma Birch. She has a bachelor's degree in theater arts from the State University of New York at New Paltz and a master's in fine arts in, the, in creative writing from California Institute of the Arts. She has been published by Blue Light Press, Great Weather for Media, Autonomy Media, A Gathering of the Tribes, yep, Vale, Vale, Vitrine, Insert Blank Press, Live Mag, Fell Swoop, Apricity, I hope I said it right, Grove Atlantic, The Brooklyn Rail, and Bella Donna. Let's hear it for Amma Birch. Hello, everybody. Wow, this is, this is fire. This is just pure fire. A 
A B zero two zero five seven seven. Solo night, worms magnified with moonlight. Sammy, are you here? A plate falls, don't know why I didn't come. Pulled the espresso shot, drenched the pool of light from the moon. Ha! That was unnecessary. I am not the wolf. I am more like the slimy eel these days. Let me pull you closer to me. The chest is full of gold. Children going home from school, dancing, crossing streets, staying with you for all time. Who can say, when will the cookie come back? You don't know what the nights are like, missing the perfect laugh in secret. Oh, put some ice in it, sing out loud and go to the moon. The light sings a beautiful song. Francis is here, what a saint. Play that music, swing, swing, swing in spring. Lost and insecure corn muffin, hold on to me. Slurp, can I enjoy a drink? Another day with ketchup on the counter, wind swept off feet, enter the Milky Way. Did you find yourself? Heroes bleed. Would you like some more hot water? First, break all of the rules. Does it feel like home? What's mine is yours. Crumple the paper, shake the plastic bag, Gregorian chants, fade into overtones, Eat more whipped cream. Rule the world. Come back. Yes, yes. Cough, cough. Puppet on a chain. Hand me a napkin. Stand by me. The smell of coffee. Can I get the deluxe? Can I be a star? Open the gates, flood the oranges, cry with the raw meat. No one knows my name. Honey comes from a rock. Palm trees in peace, kufi and pants, pulling the strings of my sakoto, prepared to jump the broom, gray suit, my father in purple and blue. The Newark riots of 1967 seem so far away, a new breed. Owl for Carl. Dawn, ancient connection, starry night, poverty, smoking, supernatural, floating cities, jazz brains, angel roof, radiant, war, publishing, odes, underwear, burning money, terror, wall, busted marijuana, New York, paradise, nightmares, blind cloud, mind toward Patterson, motionless time, cemetery, dawn's joyride, blinking light tree of Brooklyn, chain subway ride, battery brain, brilliant sank, floated listening doom, hours jumping fire moon, yakety yakking, memory shocks, intellects, recall meet pavement, vanish nowhere uh, of postcards, sweats, junks, furnished around, around, railroad broken hearts, snow bop angels, ecstasy limousines, street light, rain hungry, lonesome jazz, sex soup, eternity, volcanoes, lava, ash, poetry, beard, short, sexy, weeping, undressing, wailed, white, trembling machinery, skeletons, detectives, crime, motorcyclists, joy blown, grass, parks, giggles, sob, sword, love boys, shrewd winks, sick, golden, ecstatic beer, sweetheart, cigarettes, bed, floor, hall, fainting, vision, consciousness, million girls, sunrise, naked lakes, stolen hero memories, mountain tops, caves, lonely petticoat solipsisms, dreams, basements, offices, night, Blood, blue, floodlight crowned in oblivion, lamb, crab, the river swept, 
push carts, music boxes, bridge rose up, flame orange scribbled, rocking, rolling, incantations, yellow stanzas, gibberish, lung tortillas, pure, vegetable trucks, aids, cast, clock, cut, wrist, forth, antique stores, cried, burnt, innocent, blast, verse, clatter, iron fashion, the mustard gas editors run down soup, beer, fell, window, jazz, whiskey, toilet, moans, blast, ears, colossal whistles, highways, journey, jazz, hours, vision, 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 eternity, praying, salvation, soul, jail for charm, heart, sang blues, Buddha, locomotive, grave, trials, left, Potato salad, granite, madhouse, heads, harlequin, concrete, void, protest, blood, tears, fingers, echo, halls, soul, midnight, love, dream, a nightmare, bodies, heavy moon, book, window, door, telephone, room, down, yellow, rose, imaginary, nothing, Carl, animal, icy, vibrating, gaps, flash, trap, soul, join, dash, jumping, sensation, measure before shaking, soul, rhythm, unknown, downtime, death, rose, jazz, shadow, love, saxophone, cry, radio, heart, butchered, years. Yesterday I was, counting caterpillars with pun. We were reciting lines, boys, don't cry. Are you a boy or a girl? Do caterpillars ever get asked such questions? Pun was interested in death and burial in New Orleans. I tried to explain it to her. Language can be so futile. The barrier of knowing and not knowing. Don't all butterflies look the same, yet male monarchs have spots? Do butterflies have second line funerals? A parade of butterflies carrying their ancestor spirit home as they travel from south to north. I wrote Eileen today. They are in Greece. I asked them if they have been to Lafcadia. I wondered if there is a marker on the spot that Sappho jumped from. I'm sure you've heard about Steve Cannon by now. Uh, you know, uh, when I was a student at Cal Arts, Cal, uh, uh, Carl Hancock Rocks was uh, teaching. And they did a stage reading production of Smoke, Lily, and Jake. And unfortunately, it was my first semester, and I, I missed it. But I was reading Smoke, Lily, and Jade the other day, and it's, it's such an amazing stream of consciousness poem. And I thought about other poems that I'm in conversation with that Richard Nugent, Bruce Nugent, Bruce Nugent, Richard Nugent, he wrote. And I was really taken, like my colleagues here, by shadow and my love. But the thing about shadow is that the story is that Langston Hughes took that poem out of a waste paper basket. And then he published it in Opportunity. So, you know, Richard Nugent was kind of all over the board. And, and without people like Richard Nugent and uh, Marsha P. Johnson, uh, an out lesbian like myself, we, we wouldn't be, I wouldn't be able to exist. So I'm incredibly indebted to the work that, that he did um, and the poetry and the art that he created and his contributions to the Harlem Renaissance that were not really fully uh, appreciated at the time. And now in the future, uh, we have the opportunity to fix that omission. And it's really important that we mention Bruce Nugent's name as much as we can around the Harlem Renaissance, because even in that 
Zora Neale Hurston documentary on PBS that is really, really good right now. They don't mention Bruce Nugent once. So he's just been omitted from history. And this is our opportunity to fix that. I love, I, I love the line, I am dark, black, on the face of the moon. Isn't that, I mean, that could be a t-shirt. Maybe we should make it a t-shirt. And then I, I thought about, I was sitting at home and I thought about what poems have I written that are kind of in conversation with, with Bruce Nugent. So I, I, I have two that I want to share with you. The first one is called The Great Escape. Faces in the clouds jump in my face. A Victorian woman is riding the stallion, beating the stallion ever so softly, just enough, enough not to break the skin. She makes it tingle. The skin is tingling ever so slightly, just enough. The teacher appears. The teacher scolds the woman and her stallion. What are you two doing? What are you two doing? We are riding. We are rubbing each other ever so simply. The woman says, sweat stains the stallion's saddle as the woman and the stallion ride off into a crimson sky. And, and there's this poem, uh, Forever, which is from Sonnet Boom. A silence like a wave bides, bringing us to shore for aid. The moon rises, the waning tides, the sun, our spiral is seen another day. Eternity lasts more than a lifetime. The Sphinx will be here forever. The sun comes and goes like my prime. It passes me by during harsh weather. In Utah, there is a place in the flats where the rocks glisten in red and black. At night, there are bats and the stars can be seen while lying on your back. If aliens were to see the spiral jetty from above, they would know how much the sun is loved. And then I, I want to share one last poem. It was published in um, Paper Teller Diorama, uh, the great weather for media, uh, their anthology series. It's called Greenhouse. Put on your makeup, ride in an airplane. Angel fish swims past. Let's go to the ballpark, bounce, beach, ball, bounce into a black hole. Some days I dress like a blueberry, remembering a Monopoly game, the drive to get to boardwalk, wearing a bow tie, brainstorming, 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 a car wash, ride on the catfish, drive me to the caveman, a crossbow has me in its sights. Oh, great dragonfly, quick drop down menu, fingernail, firefly, firework. The world is a fishbowl, fisherman with a fish hook and a football for forgiveness. Cherish the French fry. Good night, grandchild. I was born near the groundhog. Have you ever been handcuffed? I've been given handouts with a handshake. My supervisor wears a headband, the honeydew of the morning, the ice cream of the afternoon. Kids playing kickball, kickboxing, I on my laptop, a lifetime of change, a lighthouse with a dying flame, mailman return, midnight gospel, give me a milkshake, let me moonwalk, it's a newborn, here's the newsletter, I need a nightlight. This morning my nose bled, 
paycheck policeman looks at a ponytail postcard, racquetball, railroad, raindrop, hell, rattlesnake, rocket ship the size of a rowboat, sail away, sailboat, spotlight of blackness, show off shoelace, grab a snowball, a blanket of snowflakes, it's a snowball, a solar system, soundproof, spaceship, take me away, grab the spearmen, follow the starfish, golden seeds of a strawberry, make me wear sunglasses, take out the timekeeper, follow the fabric timeline, where is the timekeeper? My heart needs a tugboat. Here comes the water boy with a watermelon. He's in a wheelchair without work boots. Come on. Let's let people who are watching this hear what we think of Obama. Walt Whitman once said, great poets need great audiences. You've been a great audience, and you've been great poets. Thank you for that. A special thanks to Holly Metz, whose enthusiasm um, led to this event. Let me finish off with an excerpt um, from a poem. One of, I believe, one of the last um, that Bruce Nugent wrote. It's a long poem. I'm only going to read an excerpt. What kind of men are men like these who write such thoughts abroad for all the world to see in scorn and ridicule with glee? What kind of men think thoughts like these for everyone to know? Your embarrassed smile was lame while I sat and watched it slowly find its place upon your lips and answered softly, me. Thank you, everybody.